Of course, the primary practical application of the row reduced echelon form is to help determine the null space of the matrix. Or, if we're considering this in the context of a linear system, it's to also help us determine a particular solution. So let's focus on the null space. Now, why is it valid to look at the matrix in its row reduced echelon form and determine its null space and consider that the null space of the original matrix? Well, it's valid because the row reduced echelon form is obtained by Gaussian elimination. And Gaussian elimination doesn't alter the relationship among any of the columns and therefore preserves the null space. That's why it's a valid approach. Now, it's also very easy to determine the null space if you have the matrix in the row reduced echelon form. Now, why is that? Well, there are two reasons really that work hand in hand. Number one is of course having these dream columns. The pivot columns are the dream decomposition columns because any other column is very easy to decompose with respect to these three columns just because they have a single one and the rest are all zeros. So for example, looking at the last column of this matrix, just by looking at the column itself, for now I don't even have to look at the locations of the pivot columns or anything else except this column. I can say that this column is seven times the first pivot column, wherever it is, plus eight times the second pivot columns, column, plus three times the third pivot column. Now to actually identify the position of the columns, we have to know where the pivot columns are, and then we'll be able to say that this column, the last one, is seven times the first column, plus eight times the fourth, plus three times the seventh column. So having these pivot columns makes it very easy to decompose any other column with respect to the pivot columns. Now that's half of what makes the row reduced echelon form so perfect for determining the null space. Part two of what makes the row reduced echelon form ideal for determining the null space is the fact that we know that every non-pivot column contributes an element to the null space. And being able to involve a new column each time convinces us that the elements that we're considering are indeed new for the null space. They're linearly independent from other elements of the null space that took advantage of other non-pivot columns. So let's use those ideas in this very example and determine the null space of this matrix. And that's very good practice. You should really do it a few times. Consider a few row reduced echelon forms for different matrices and determine the null space simply by looking at the row reduced echelon form. Now we talked previously on a number of occasions that very often you are able to tell the null space by identifying the relationship among the columns simply by looking at the matrix. But if you're not able to, you perform Gaussian elimination, you bring the matrix to its row reduced echelon form, at which point it's super easy to see all of the relationships and determine the entire null space. Just march through the row reduced echelon form of the matrix, one non-pivot column at a time, realize its relationship to the pivot columns, and express that relationship as an element in the null space. So let's do it here. I'm just making sure I have enough space. And because the null space in this case is five dimensional, because we have one, two, three, four, five non-pivot columns, uh, we will have, I must leave enough space for all of the five elements. And each one of them is relatively tall because it has eight elements. So I will write, relatively small. So the first element of the null space comes from the first non-pivot column of this matrix, which of course is twice the first pivot column of the matrix. And therefore the corresponding element in the null space is two, negative one, followed by six zeros. The second element of the null space comes from the second non-pivot column and of course reflects the fact that this non-pivot column is the zero column, which simply puts a one in the corresponding location here, followed by five zeros. All right, for the third one, let's look at the 
third non-pivot column in the matrix and related to the pivot columns that came before it. And even though we can relate this non-pivot column, let's say, to the second column and this column, let's not do that. Let's be systematic by relating each non-pivot column only to the pivot columns that came before it allows you to be systematic, avoid a lot of errors, and also by the time you have to program row reduce special on form in a language such as MATLAB or Python, this is a good rule to pursue. And it also gives you the null space in a sort of canonical form that's easily recognizable. Okay, so for the third element of the null space, Notice that this column is, of course, twice the first column and three times the fourth column. So we're only relating all columns to the pivot columns that came before them. So our pivot columns are our primary tools of decomposition. So two in the first location, three in the fourth location, because it's three of column four, which, of course, produces the fifth column, so putting minus one in the fifth column, results in the zero column, which is what the null space is all about. So now we have three out of the five elements. So let's consider this next one, delta. And it's of course three of the first pivot column, zero, zero, four, of the second pivot column, which is the fourth column in the matrix. That produces the sixth column. So we ignore the fifth, put minus one for the sixth, and put zeros here. And now I'd like to mention that a lot of people actually prefer these entries to be ones rather than negative ones. And I can see how that's an attractive choice. And if you would like to make that choice, go ahead. Just remember to flip all of the other numbers. So it doesn't matter. I prefer the minus one just because I look at these entries and whatever entries I see here, these, those are the entries that make it into the null space. And then I put a minus one just to subtract what I've accumulated so far to get the zero column. That's just my way of thinking about it. But perhaps flipping all the numbers and having ones in all of these positions has more advantages than the advantage I just mentioned. Doesn't matter. Okay, and now for the last element, it has to do with the last non-pivot column of the matrix. And it is seven of the first column, eight of the second pivot column, three of the third pivot column, which is in the seventh location. So four, five, six, three, negative one. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. All right, so that's that seems just about right. So as you can see, determining the null space from the row reduced echelon form is pretty much a trivial exercise. It is so easy, you can teach a computer to do it. And that's a very good standard for an algorithm. If an algorithm is so precise that you can translate it into code, then it's a good algorithm. And determining the null space from the row reduced echelon form certainly lives up to that standard. That's number one. Number two, this pretty much closes the book on the question that came up over and over again, which is that question only came up when we would look at the matrix and without performing any Gaussian elimination, we would try to identify the relationships among the columns and from that determine the null space. And sometimes the question arose, how do we know that we're done, that we have found all the relationships? And also, how do we know that the relationships that we've written down, that we've identified, are independent? And sometimes it was a little bit confusing, and sometimes it was not at all clear what the answers to those questions were. Then we got a great amount of help from a very important relationships, relationship that we observed, that the dimension of the column space plus the dimension of the null space equals the number of columns. And of course, the logic of that argument is very much reflected in the row reduced echelon form of the matrix, because we said that every column is either linearly independent from the ones that came before it, in which case it helps 
grow the column space, doesn't help grow the column space, in which case it actually augments the column space, or it's linearly dependent on the columns that came before it, in which case it augments the null space. And you can see that the columns that were linearly independent from the columns that came before it end up being the pivot columns in the row reduced echelon form, and the ones that were linearly dependent on the columns that came before it end up being the non-pivot columns, and you can see how they contribute to the null space. So that relationship was a great deal of help because if you knew the dimension of the column space, then you knew the dimension of the null space, and then you knew when to stop. That is, if you knew the dimension of the column space. So it was only helpful if you knew the dimension of the column space or could at least say something about the dimension of the column space. But it also didn't help you answer the question of, well, did you uh, double count some relationship? Did you use did you notice the relationships in such a way that what the last relationship that you noticed followed from two previous relationships that you noticed? We didn't have any help for that question. Well, now we have a definitive answer. When the matrix is in the row reduced echelon form, number one, you have as many dimensions as the null space as there are non-pivot columns. So that question of count is answered once and for all. And when it's the, in the row reduced echelon form, it's very easy to make sure that at every step for every new element, you use a new column from the matrix. And that assures that every new element is linearly independent from the elements that came before it. Now, of course, you could have done it in the original matrix as well. Just make sure you use a new column every time, but maybe on certain occasions it wasn't that easy. So in any case, all of those questions that came up before uh, were answered pretty well or almost completely for practical purposes, but the row reduced echelon form answers them completely. So next, we'll do two things. I'll pose a very interesting challenge, and I will also show you a spectacular conceptual application of the row reduced echelon form that's one of the true miraculous gems of linear algebra.